It should never have happened. It'll never be again because you can't grow the forest again. It'll take 400 years to grow that tree. I didn't expect them to come into the piece that we were on. And on the third day, they did attempt it. And that's when we had a confrontation. When they closed down the New Zealand Forest Service, they took away their lives. They didn't just take away their jobs, it was their lives. For me, Piriora is special because it's one of the most intact forest ecosystems, certainly in, in the central North Island. The wildlife values here are just extraordinary. What really stands out at Piriora is the dense canopies of podocarps at 40 metres plus. They're just like a giant cathedral. The future of canopy science in New Zealand is really limitless. There's endless questions and some of the answers will be really important for the future of the forest and how we manage them. Well, my name is Bruce Archer. I arrived here in 1946. I couldn't believe it. I'd never seen bush like it, you know. Around Awakuni, the bush was a lot smaller, no, no trees anything like this size. Well, there was absolutely nothing here, of course, when I arrived. And uh, we leveled the site, and then they came in, they put the state houses up fairly quickly. They, I think there was 11 or 12 state houses there for the forestry workers. And then shortly afterwards, they built the sawmills, C&A Odlin and Ranganui Timber Company, and uh, I leveled the sites for them and put the roads in, and then they, they put the little uh, mill houses in. They were a little flat top house, you know, very inferior to the state house, was always a sore point. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I saw the development right from the start, from the very start of Puriwara Forest. You worked among some pretty tough guys, you know, some of the sawmilling guys and bushmen, they were tough people and you had to have meals with them, you had to, you know, mix with them. We played a little bit of cricket and a game of two up, a pay night was two up night. And of course with the game was going so well if you were winning a, winning a few bob, you didn't want to stop. <laughs> we thought we were hard boys, but because we used to stay out in the bush for three weeks. Some of those old fellows, they used to talk about staying in the bush for three months just in living in tents. In this type of bush, we'd probably do 150, maybe 170 trees a day because they're so close together. You'd like you'd leave the tucker bag there and at lunchtime or <laughs> you'd only be here. You know, that's how thick it was. But they were huge, huge trees. Following scarfing by axe, eight-foot drag-tooth cross-cut saws were used on the bigger trees. This was tough work, and a team could come to blows if one man wasn't pulling the saw. Sing a song of a remu drag, dropping a tree on a mountain crag. The pigeons fly in the matai trees, and the sound of the axe comes down the breeze, chipping the scarfs and the snipes and dees, and the headlocks fall in a hive of bees. We laid off the Puriora North Block in 1967, and that was for 15 years. And from my memory is right, it was 700,000 cubic feet. 700,000 cubic feet a year for 15 years. You couldn't visualise it at the time, but it was after the war and, and there was a big, big demand for, for housing and, and timber, which 
for very short, and they really got into these forests to, to supply the timber to build the state houses. Many houses in New Zealand were built from this tree, and it's so tragic that we have such a little amount left. We had been campaigning for a couple of years uh, on a petition called the Marua Declaration to ask the government to stop logging of all of our lowland virgin native forests. And um, during the course of that, we visited this forest just very briefly. And I was so taken by the majesty of it. So as soon as we'd finished the petition, I put some time into doing some field work and uh, we presented a 100 page document to Parliament and asked them to urgently stop logging because of the tragic situation. There's only a tiny remnant of ancient Tōtara, Kōkako, and um, they failed to respond. And so we had no other choice but to climb the trees. The native forest conservation battles of the 1970s came to a head right here in January 1978 with a massive confrontation between the bulldozers and the tree sitters. From day one we occupied the forest when they couldn't log anywhere in it and be sure that they weren't going to put somebody's um, life in danger. And in fact they did put my brother's life in danger. He sat up on top of a tree. While he saw them walk past the base of the tree, put crosses on trees right next to him. Some minutes later they came through, he could hear the bulldozer crushing through the forest directly towards him. You imagine yourself in that situation, you're there to save that tree, and you hear the bulldozer come towards you. He said nothing. The crosscutter gets his chainsaw out and cuts down the massive big tree, 40 feet high, Rimu tree, right next to him. He still said nothing. After the tree was down, he then waved and told him he was there, and they couldn't believe that he stood his ground. Then they realised that these people were serious and that, and that they couldn't actually log the forest. They assumed that if they went anywhere near a tree, near a tree somebody would freak out and say, hey, 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 stop, you know. It then gave them an out and so they, they cut the logging, stopped the logging that day at that moment on the basis of safety grounds. There were people in the towns and, and all over the place supporting us, but the core group, there were just about a dozen of us. One of the things that happened with that protest is that we had such broad-scale support in the community um, because of the previous work we'd done. We had scientific, scientists supporting us, we had grassroots people on the streets supporting us, politicians standing up supporting us, and it was right across the community. And even in the logging towns, where you once used to walk through and you used to go through like this to the logging town and <laughs> as quickly as you could. A um, couple of years later you walk through and people shake your hand. I didn't used to like the jokers who set up the trees. Uh, but now I might like them but I think what they did was the right thing to do and we should have done it ourselves, you know. I knew, I knew that they'd come in, you know. And it was fair enough, I think it was, it was great that they came in to protect the, the big totras and, and the birds. It should never have happened. You know, this is magnificent. I arrived at the point in time the decision had been made to phase out the logging but the real big issue here was for the community itself and they didn't get a lot of consideration. All of a sudden it all disappeared. Only because there was no more mills, there was no more forestry and uh, they actually delivered it back to conservationists to take over the state forest. Unfortunately, uh, we were second. What hurt our people most was the um, lack of communication. People felt threatened because there was already talk, oh, we're going to stop this, we're going to stop that. 
So our parents went into panic mode because no one was telling them what to do about it. They were just going to be told it was happening. So it divided our people. When they closed down the New Zealand Forest Service, they took away their lives. They didn't just take away their jobs, it was their lives. Sadly, everyone had to go away. You know, had to uproot themselves what was, from what was always home. Yeah, and go into um, unfamiliar territory, into the cities. Um, some went with very broken hearts and didn't survive. Um, some have left that, that hurt or that mummy behind and it's instilled in the children too. Oh, this is what happened. So we're trying to dispel a lot of that, um, that hurt, a lot of that anger by letting them see, well, this is yours. This is your home. Come back and let's do something about it. While we were up in the trees, the kuia from this area, the, the Māori elder, she came here with her mokopuna, her grandkids, and said, hey, what's going on, you know, because of our jobs, etc." And I said, well, you've seen what's happening to the forest. These trees are going to be gone very soon. And so whatever's going to happen to your people, let's try and work it out so that it happens now, rather than when all the trees are gone. She understood that. Now we've got a beautiful forest that was left by a, a nice lady called Martha Epi. She uh, left it here for us, as well as Stephen King, which to me is the greatest thing that ever was, that uh, I've been uh, very grateful for them. Today, we, I would never have imagined what it would be like 30 years ago, sit standing here today. It's a very different feeling, um, very special and very deep. The journey to get to here and you see we've still got a beautiful forest, it's the most gratifying thing that I can really imagine, you know, it's wonderful. This Puriora forest and this Rimu habitat, mixed podocarp habitat, supported the biggest population that survived of Kōkako, so it presented the best hope for the survival of its species into the future. And that was one of the key messages that we had with our campaign. The Kōkako is a member of the wattle bird family. It's one of those truly unique New Zealand birds, not a, a relatively recent immigrant from Australia, something which has been here for a long, long time. And one of the, that group of birds which fared very poorly after human arrival and the, the introduction of predatory mammals. So it's one of those old, old, genuine relics of primeval New Zealand. I arrived um, working at Periora just at the end of the, the, the work with Kōkako that was associated with the logging controversy and the impacts of, of selection logging on birds. And so we started um, a series of studies really focused on Kōkako, looking to see what was happening to nesting attempts and um, monitoring populations really closely. And it turned out that, um, that birds were, the adults were living a long time, but they were failing to recruit young because the nests were being eaten by um, by predators. In the 1970s and 80s we thought that if we locked up the forests we would save them. Well unfortunately that has not proved to be the case. Our forests are still deteriorating at a, a noticeable rate with the browsing by introduced mammals, deer and possums in particular, and the continuing predation by rats and other introduced mammals of our birds and insects. I think the big danger with a lot of our forests is that we make the mistake of thinking that statutory protection is all that they need. In fact, they're subject to ongoing decline from the pervasive long-term effects of a whole raft of introduced uh, pest species. These forests uh, should be alive with, not just with birds, but with uh, reptiles, with bats, with large invertebrates. And in the absence of active control of those predators, um, they're not. Pest control in Periora has had to learn a lot about the ecology of the pests and, and, and ways that you get their numbers low enough to make a difference. But I think that the, the success of wildlife here is undoubtedly because of successful pest control. And Kokako has disappeared 
from places where there is no pest control, they simply don't exist anymore. The numbers, uh, we watch them decline here as um, from a lack of recruitment, but um, some of the adults hung on, it got down to eight pairs, 1995, in, in the Waipapa ecological area at Puriora. And now there's um, over 120 pairs. So it's been a conservation success story the last two or three decades. Um, and I say to people, if you, if you want a wildlife experience, you, know, you don't need to go to offshore islands, then, then you can go to Puriora. And to have this density of, of tall podocarp trees towering over you know, an intact tower canopy, um, there are precious few places in the North Island, at least, where you can have this experience. A podocarp is a member of the southern hemisphere family of conifers called podocarpaceae. Their female cone has a fleshy receptacle with a seed on top, quite unlike most other conifers. A typical New Zealand forest is composed of a combination of podocarp and broadleaf trees. It's a sort of a fundamental distinction in our forests. Our podocarps are the sort of the older, more primitive group of species in evolutionary terms. The broadleaf trees are far more diverse and they combine to form this complex structure where we have large emergent podocarps sticking out up above a canopy of broadleaf trees. And that's one of the really distinctive features of so many of our forests. Rimu is a really important tree in our forest. It's the second commonest, the second most widely distributed tree in the forest. It provides the top tier, the emergent layer in the forest. It's a really important cornerstone or keystone species for the way these forests work because of its massive size, its massive root plates and the fact that it's basically everywhere. There are very few places left in the North Island that have the intact forest pattern that Puriora has and Puriora is really the last real examples that survive. This is primeval New Zealand at its best. up in a tall tree looking at epiphytes or just enjoying the experience is really amazing. It is a privilege and there's a sense of 
genuine wonder, you know, the view from up here, how all the plants look from above is always capturing my imagination and calming me down when I get a bit nervous about climbing. But it's all worthwhile because not many people get to see this. We're up 35 metres up a large rimu tree and what's it like up here? It makes me feel humbled that I've got the privilege to be up here. It's something special, it's hard to describe the feeling I have when I'm up in these magnificent native trees. It's almost like this is one of those things that I was born to do. The first time I climbed it was like a world opening up to me that I'd never seen before. Uh, the challenge of climbing these large trees is significant con compared to a, a park tree. I mean, these trees have been here for centuries. The epiphytes, the size of the branching, just the height of them makes them a challenge to climb. They're not the tallest trees in the world, but they are full of sensitive plants that um, require care and attention when you're, when you're climbing. The main reason that our canopies in New Zealand and around the world haven't been explored much is the difficulty of access. Um, difficulty and danger actually, there is an element of risk in climbing up these very tall trees and of course um, it's not for everyone so it's limited how much study can be done here and also I think we've just been so occupied with research on the ground that this is, this is the next natural step and it's exciting to be a part of it. When you're climbing these trees, it's ideal if you can get a good high shot up to the top of the tree. So you've got an access line that takes you past all the epiphytes, or at least the majority of the epiphytes. Once you've got a good high anchor point, you can virtually go to most places within the canopy. Delicately does it. I'm right at the top. I started delving into canopy science for my Masters of Science degree, um, where I studied a shrub epiphyte. And since then I've kept enjoying climbing trees and just naturally found an interest and curiosity in the, all the plants that grow up here. I find the canopy really interesting because it's the last frontier of forest science. It's the last place on land that we haven't really studied. There's lots of plants and animals that live up here and we know very little about them. So it's really cool to be making discoveries and observations that not many people have done before. And part of that is the adventure of climbing up here. Tree climbing allows you to really get up close and personal with these plants and see so much more than you can from the ground. So we often use binoculars to get an idea of what's growing here. But being up close allows you to see the importance, for example here, of the moss and how thick that is and how it's providing habitat for so many other species. Their relationship's so complex and we think there's quite a facilitation cascade which means that each plant that arrives on a bare branch facilitates the arrival of another. So we might start with moss mats, which then build up the moisture and substrate for the arrival of small ferns, which then keep building and make that substrate more complex for the nest epiphytes, the shrub epiphytes, and even the accidentals to arrive. And that's a really interesting and important ecological relationship that needs a lot more research. The future of canopy science in New Zealand is really limitless. We just need longer term studies of these communities because there's endless questions and some of the answers will be really important for the future of the forest and how we manage them. 80% of our native plants in New Zealand are found nowhere else on earth. 
And I don't mind whether it's a tiny little moss or the smallest orchid in the world that grows on the top of these big trees or the big tree itself or the ecosystem it supports. They are all inspiring. We really would like to share this world with lots of people because people only care for what they understand. So hopefully we can spread the word and get more and more people exploring this world. If we can just open these things to other people's eyes and bring them into it so that they can engage with it and see this magical world, then we will all look after it, I think.